Okay, thank you very much. I think if we just settle down. Um, yes, you know, I had called her before. I would ask um, the incentives group, Buki or Labi, right? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Buki. I am a partner at a law firm, and I was. Um, opportune to sit in with four other people in my group um, made up of other lawyers, sports stakeholders, and um, in-house, and NESG staff as well. And um, we had our money woman as well, someone who works in investments. So we had a, a good mix of people. And for us, what was key um, was to identify what incentives would encourage professional parties and trade unions to want to take part in sports. But we didn't just look at that, we also looked at what would encourage sports participants as well to continue to engage in sports, which will in turn then make the rest of us want to be interested, because I think that's what's key for us. We, we, there is interest, but we want to ensure that we, there's some kind of benefits from that interest. So for us, we identified two key areas as um, a possible problems of us not currently having incentives, because what we did for the background was to see what do we currently have now? What incentives do we have in the sports industries for professionals like ourselves? And we went around the room and we could barely come up with anything. So we thought, what are the two key areas that are making us lack in these incentives? And we identified one as the sports industry slow things don't move as quickly as we would like. So any incentive that will be set up, we would want something that will make things move faster for us. And secondly, um, we identified the expense of doing business in sports. And we, from that, we took home the note that we need to have some kind of tax rebates in most of our dealings in the sports industry. So it encourages us to want to participate. So this list is, um, it's no, it's not it's um, it's not, it's it's not exhaustive to be honest because there's a lot and a lot that can be done in this industry to encourage us, but we identified some key areas that we think we can ha today talk about, and I will encourage my um, mem members of my team to also pitch in on anything else they want to when I mention each item. So the very first one we talked about was intellectual property. Now we identify that a lot of sports participants suffer from this. Uh, it happens in entertainment as well and all other industries, but the sports participants in particular suffer from this, and this in turn affects the sports guys and the sports business guys. So what happens is I have my intellectual property and somebody else is acting and using it and it's going to cost me too much money to pursue it because the lawyers, people think we're expensive. It's not like that. Though. It's, it's a lie. And lawyers are expensive and the time is going to take in court. So what we identified as one possible incentive is some sort of tax rebate where sports in particular so enjoys a discounted rate for pursuing these issues. We have sports arbitration, but those are expensive and there are not that many lawyers that are even involved in that industry right now. So we need to encourage the lawyers to want to come on board and we need to encourage the sports participants as well to tackle this. If they feel they are being infringed in any way, they should go ahead and tackle it. So one thing we had suggested is some sort of registry regionally, so where we have that currently in the capital markets, where the NSC and the SEC, these are the lawyers we identify as the capital market operators. You go to them, these are the people we know you can do business with. Anybody else, they are not recognized. We need to have that as well. We need to have specialists where we say, look, come to us as lawyers, register with us. And, we, and the government then says in turn, we would identify you as the lawyers or the professionals or the auditors, the accountants that are specialists in this area. So people will come to you and we know that the advice they are getting from you is something that is regulated by us. So it's a give and take on both sides for the professionals and the regulators. And then another thing we identified was immigration and labor. 
how easy is it for our sports industry to move in and out of countries? One of our members had talked about the difficulty they have getting sponsors for the basketball team, for instance. And I know some people that have applied for sports visas, it takes them forever to get it, and most times they are turned down. That's already, you've already filled, What's, there's nothing else to do. You can just stay in Lagos and be running around. That's your sport right there. But what we are encouraging as an incentive is we have a situation where awareness, first of all, because I understand there are agencies, private agencies, that can help you facilitate your visas and all of that, but not many people are aware of it or can afford it. So the government needs to partner with the private sector, make people aware of these um, 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 agencies that make things easier for them. And we don't want a situation where people are going to cross the desert because they want to go out of the country to go and run. And by the time they get to where they are going to, they can't even do the sports anymore. So we need to create awareness. And how you can do that is it, it's in partnership. The government can't do it alone. Private sector cannot do it alone because they won't be trusted. I'm going to go out and see on the wall someone writing, apply here for visa. I can get it for you in two days. I won't go. So in, it's a partnership that needs to happen. And it's the only way we can then encourage interest. So I think that's another incentive we had identified. And then talking about money, because money is important as well. One of our members had talked about two things. It's important for them to get their returns back, and it's important for them to make profits. Yes, they want to do good. You have the kind of investors that impact investors that want to see the community grow, want to see the young girls more involved in football, because it's not just a male sport. I suffered from that in the 90s. I wanted to play football, but it wasn't happening. So um, we, we, we have investors like that. We have investors that want to make money and we'll have the investors that want to see the impact. How do you encourage them? What would you say to them that, look, if you put in this investment, you are going to get something back? Now, one major thing she mentioned was stability. I mean, we, we don't, today this government is in, tomorrow another one will come and say, no, uh -uh, this tax, who gave you this rebate? They shouldn't have. We want a situation where regionally, nationally, in our country, where you say to us, look, as a business, investors, private equity investors, you come in, you invest this money, we will back it as the government and we'll put this guarantee in. And this involves lawyers and the accountants and the advisors as well, where we have agreements and we say, look, it is government backed. It's not just a money market product. Sports itself is a value. Unfortunately, we haven't valued it in Nigeria and we need to get to that place. So it's important that we put a value and it's only the government and the private sector that can do it together. We put a value to our sports and you incentivize um, it, you provide this incentive to people and say, look, invest in this and we'll back it up with this. That backing needs to be there. So we identify that and it's something we'll develop more in our paper. And just to wrap up so that other people have um, time to to continue. Um, it, it, we had talked about one thing. Incentive is important, but we mentioned that maybe our meeting should have been jointly with the policy makers because it all stems from that. So the incentives you would give would rely on whatever policies exist in or is to come. So um, monitoring, evaluation, key as well. So I guess all of our sessions do have a hand in each other and they overlap. And we're looking forward to hearing what other people say so we can also use that to develop a paper that will then leave in your capable hands. So thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. The incentives people have been able to tie everybody into the room to be able to, I mean, and their usefulness and their in, input into what we're doing. So we, we're going to call on the investment. Olufemi and Ade Doin were in that group. Olufemi, were you in that group? OK. And um, the group was led by Mr. Olawale Rashid from the Abuja Chamber of Commerce. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Olawale Rashid. I'm, I'm the policy director for Abuja Chamber of Commerce and Industry. We had a fruitful discussion on the issue of investment. And Madam actually came to us and said, where would the money come from? Tell us. Leave the other obstacles. So we identified some areas. The first thing is, um, as a person from the Chamber of Commerce, why would people not invest in, in the sporting sector? We identified some issues either with government or with the operating environment of businesses in the country. We also look into where can the money come from. We also identify some areas. Uh, I will run through them. 
uh, not fully developed, but we'll further develop it uh, later. One, we think for you to have uh, the investment we are seeking for the, uh, from the private sector in the sports industry, there must be a framework for that investment. As at now, if you go to the sports ministry and you say you, you have something to do in the sports sector, they will ask you to go and bring the money. And there is no rules subsisting that actually guide what do you do within the sector, what should you not do in terms of bringing in your money. Because uh, I was former, a former ministerial advisor in that ministry. And, and we know how the system works. Once you are a private sector person and you enter the place, the first thing is where will the thing come from? So there should be a framework that actually encourages uh, investment, the private sector people. They will see that this is truly business, not uh, our usual Nigerian system. Then um, we have somebody told us, okay, I'll skip this. Uh, we also think the last person has talked about it, about uh, dispute resolution. When you want to come and invest in a sector, we think there should always be because that's one of the main issues. If you have dispute in terms of investment, then you go to court and you end up spending four, five, six years. And the judges, uh, the Nigerian system, like we are facing. So we think in every sporting investment uh, agreement, there should always be an ADR clauses. Uh, I think that is clear. Yeah, somebody has also mentioned it here. And the third one we think is, one, we could have FDI, foreign direct investment, in sporting companies in Nigeria. Now, Adidas can set up a, 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 a manufacturing plant, I mean a plant in Nigeria, where they produce uh, sporting goods and facilities. And instead of them actually bringing it down here, they produce here. And we also have rules governing ownership of companies that we apply. We think FDI is key because one, uh, the, the standard has been set up there and it's better to also, also key into it here. Yeah. Now, World Bank has been doing a lot for the creative industry. We think that's an area we should also explore. There could be project funding from the World Bank. We'll also develop this further in our full report. Then there is this lottery fund. And we all know the bulk of the money going to the lottery fund is coming from sporting activities. We think the bulk of the money of the from that fund to be going into sport investment. But the existing law now does not allow that. We think there should be an amendment. We propose that here to the sports lottery fund law. Hmm? Yeah. Hmm. It. Okay. Now, as at now, we are talking about uh, infrastructure gap and stadia and all those. We should have a system that we encourage private sector people to actually build sports infrastructure. As at now, it's not working. It's not there. So we think that's a, a major area, and that's where we need the framework that we revert to. How can people bring in their money to build facilities? What will be their relationship with the government in terms of running it? And CBN has been setting up a lot of special funding. Uh, as at last time we met them in Abuja, we, we counted almost 15 special funds billions of naira. We think there should be a special funding category for the sports sector. And accessibility to the fund should be for re sport-related businesses, those who want to set up companies to produce sport wares or even to sponsor one program or the other. Then um, our attention was called to a policy. It's not a policy. It's, it's a statement from Nigerian football uh, Nigeria Professional Football League, that 50% of government ownership in, in club, in government-owned club, should be divested. Private sector should be allowed to take... It has not been implemented. We think implementing it is a way of bringing him private sector funding into... Then, um, as to community sport facilities, uh, we all look at it. The money is not there at the grassroots. What do we do to now develop those facilities at, this, at the local level. We think OPS will be allowed to work through a framework closely with schools. Since we have primary, secondary schools scattered all over, 
uh, businesses in those areas, or even outside those areas, can be encouraged to actually work with schools, to upgrade facilities, and to also pull people into the sports sector. Let's go to the top. Uh, we, have, we have something that is not clear to us, but we want to dig into it further. Somebody told us that a uh, few years back that bank MDs, before tax, they normally have 10% of their profits set aside jointly, and they decide which sector to now channel it to in terms of loan and funding. We don't know how this will work, but we think telcos, oil and gas companies and all those should be encouraged to invest in sports, but not through CSR. CSR money is too small. It cannot actually answer the question we are raising. But we'll develop this further. The man that raised the issue, we have asked him to, I asked him to talk more about it. He will send more details so that we can add it as, our, as part of our recommendation. And lastly, up. Yeah. We have a total of 13 recommendations, but we want to develop and build it up. And we also welcome suggestions and ideas from the house. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Lawale Rashid. Honestly speaking, some of the stuff we've heard is very, very encouraging, particularly in terms of the, uh, you know, addressing the issue of professionalizing sports by divesting government from the, the professional clubs. It sounds like a tall order, but it's, it's really, it's doable, yes. You know, there is nothing that is not, we all sat here, and Nitel became, uh, Nitel became bare bones after a while. I know you can't say anything. <laughs> I, we didn't ask for your opinion. <laughs> I'd like to call on Engineer I of Fanny Moku. He led the infrastructure uh, group. And Kewe, are you ready with your... Kewe was the rapporteur, you know, to tell us what uh, infrastructure came up with. Since um, in, in, uh, investment has said that they have money. Good afternoon. Yes, the infrastructure breakout session look at what actions that be required from the private sector point of view and the kind of infrastructure to be put together to make sports development encouraging. First of all, we look at the infrastructure the way they are today. The ones that are even existing are decaying. And looking at it, it will not encourage anybody to want to say want to develop any uh, any other sporting arena. So we now think that the first thing is for the four. My group that we should make sports to be a business to serve as a business, so that entrepreneurs can be encouraged to come into it fully. Of course, that is to remove the, the government from um, participating in it. That is, we are looking at a private sector-led sporting facilities, which we believe should be encouraged for sports to move ahead. So, like I said, number one is that from our recommendation is sports should be made and be seen as a business. And sport facilities should be built to generate its own funds. So once they are built to generate their own funds, that means those people putting their own funds in, in it will ensure that it's properly run and it generates enough revenue to pay for it. Facilities should not be built for football only. So far, most of our arenas or most of the uh, sporting arenas are 
soccer or football based. We are looking at a multi-dimensional uh, sporting ar arena that can be used for other things. So that, that apart from football, you can use for indoor facilities, it can be used for um, events, viewing centers, and of course each facility is, each facility is supposed to have at least for it to generate its own fund, uh, restaurants, internet access, ETC for use. Now, looking at the way some of the cities that we have now, they are not built around people. They are a bit far away from where people stay. Uh, so we are looking at a community-based sporting arenas so that, first of all, it is easier for people in the community to come together or even after working late in the night, you can come around 8 p.m., 9 p.m. to, uh, uh, yeah, to go and exercise, jog, or play uh, some of these indoor sports. So we are looking at such so that communities are going to be the center of uh, our development. We then look at it that, um, yes, since we are talking about national, it's possible. But looking at Lagos, Lagos is a peculiar place that land is, is very scarce. So we may not be able to have that uh, land available for every, uh, every community for use. So we are looking at, okay, once the policies is being put together to encourage all schools, starting from creches, um, nursery, primary, to engage in physical activities. So definitely, and we know that most of the public schools have enough land that can still be used to develop a community kind of uh, sporting arena. That, that one will now be made such that individuals can partner with those schools where lands are not available to put up this kind of um, same, um, multi, multi-use business centers, uh, sporting centers. Then, okay, I've said that in areas where new development is not possible, the existing facilities can be adopted and properly developed. The sporting facilities should be regulated. That one is another way of improving on the infrastructure of those facilities. When putting up these facilities, we believe security checks and safety measures should be incorporated because now we know that a lot of emphasis should be placed on security, at least to encourage people to come out and definitely, once it's been handled by private concern, of course, in, uh, you will know how to ensure that those security checks and facilities are put in place to ensure that people can assess the facilities at any time of the day. Then the facilities are going to be put in areas where business can be attracted and facilities will be all encompassing which I've said, I've said earlier, it can, it, they can be rented out for other events. And of course, we are ensuring that to have fitness centers. It's not only for uh, playing football or uh, swimming or whatever, but then fitness centers are going to be included, which we believe can generate a lot of fund for the operators of such facilities. And then, when we are putting up these facilities in the, in the community base, the clubs that are supposed to be involved in running these facilities or in, in making use of these facilities are not going to be based only on football. We will encourage them to be engaged in other sporting events like athletics, 
uh, swimming, tennis, indoor games generally. Yeah, indoor facilities should be there. And of course, social activities, which we have mentioned, we have mentioned earlier. Then, where um, we cannot put all this together, we are looking at facilities that are in close, say, proximities. Let's say between two local governments or between two communities that are not far apart, if one community is having swimming and tennis, and that one can have uh, several ball, but, uh, uh, basketball, badminton, so that they can easily share, the share, share facilities across uh, to each other. And of course, we talk about some of these facilities, depending on where they are sited, can even be used as car parks to generate fund for the operators. Then we believe that current government owned facilities should be sold. The government has no <laughs> business in having hands in your own facilities because you know, the examples are the ones that are existing now are badly managed. I mean, after every festival, after we did this one, the one in Lagos, one in Abuja, they have overgrown. So, and I believe that if it's been handled by a private investor, you ensure proper facility management, which I believe is another thing that can be introduced in the curriculum of the technical, I mean, of the sporting uh, community, yeah. Sports facility management should be incorporated into the school curriculum. Yes, that's what I said. And of course, the law should encourage private sector owned facilities. So, these are some of, of the recommendations that we have come out with, which we are going to develop further. So, thank you very much. The, the issue of facilities is always uh, uh, why do people laugh when they say government? You, uh, government, why are you all laughing? You people will see the truth and you don't want to say it. <laughs> and finally, we will call Mrs. Toyosi Alabi and her rapporteur, Emmanuel, to come and now tie up all of this stuff, all everything we've had into recommended uh, inputs into the national sports industry policy from a trade and professional group's perspective. Thank you, Mrs. Alabi. I think the tricky part of this our group is the fact that we've all been talking about recommended policies. So we are actually more or less keen into everything that has been discussed. But unfortunately, we were not in your room and we had on our own discussed what we thought were possible policies. So there may be some overlap, but the idea would be at the end of the day to collate all into policy. We started out by identifying the fact that in relation to this sector, the idea of policy is to ensure that there's activity ongoing in the sector. And activities by either the active participants, meaning those who actually participate in sports, and the business people. Since what we're trying to ensure is, at the end of the day, the bottom line, which is the money, you know, is moving. And in keying into this, we looked at our objectives, which is one, to ensure that we have a robust policy at the end of the day and identify gaps in the current one, which would be the way to go to developing a robust one. To include in our policy development a financial policy framework that will tap into the business potentials of sports development and its commercialization. To look at the incentives required for private sector-led development of the industry and initiatives that would trigger areas of market development to ensure, beg your pardon, <laughs> just missed my, to ensure rapid sports industrialization. And then we also want to ensure that we have a focused legislation that would drive the implementation of the sports, uh, sports policy. By this, we may not need a full-blown legislation. It may be that in reviewing existing legislation, we have sufficient legal framework to drive you know, this policy. It needs to be keyed in together because in Nigeria, we're very fond of 
multiplying and having multiplicity in what we do rather than looking at the existing and ensuring so that the existing works with what we're trying to achieve. We also want, also as an objective, look at governance and institutional strategies that are required to unlock the identified potentials to deliver on the immediate investment milestones. We now identified the challenges, a lot of which was highlighted in the background to our presentation today. One of them being the fact that, as we know, there's inadequate data. Even as we were listening to the presentation this morning, it was clear that at the end of the day, there's a lot of hazarding of guesses because there's insufficient data in order to even measure what the activity terrain is and what is actually required. And without data, we don't know what we have, we don't know what we need. There's also the fact that the financial institutions today, much as they're playing in many sectors, and we identified the creative sector in particular, there seems to be no incentive for them to play in this sector. So what are the ways in which we can make them see this sector as a commercially va valuable one? And then also, what can we do about the 60 million youths that are out there to ensure that they have all they need to foster their growth on youth empowerment for sports industrialization? How can we create the appetite for our own local content distribution? It was identified that today we do not have sufficient broadcasts on our own local sporting activities. A lot of what we're interested in and what we see is on the, from the international terrain. We talked about the general challenge, which is insecurity in various parts of the country. And then we identified the fact that government interference, initially we thought it was too much, but we feel that it's actually inappropriate. So in identifying how government should actually feature, you know, was very key, you know, to, to us. So starting with the general, which is in whatever we do, we need to identify what the existing legislation is, see what we can key in, in formulating our own framework, or we create we recommend that new legislation be created. But whichever way, we take first the government's involvement, and what we're trying to see is, in trying to harness what is appropriate government intervention, we've already identified the fact that education is very key. And it's from education, knowing that the age bracket of the active participants are people who should be in school, in identifying those people, and in ensuring that they have all it takes for them to play in the activity, we need a revamp of our educational curriculum, and we need specificity in relation to the level of sports context or sports education that should be in that curriculum. And there, after that goes the training required, and of course the infrastructure that has already been provided all through education, all through schools at cross levels. For that one, we need government's involvement. They may not be the one drawing up the curriculum, but they need to implement. We need policy that would make mandatory the curriculum, the necessary training, and the necessary infrastructure. We also identify the fact that um, in terms of enabling the financial institutions, who we know are a key player today, since they're the money providers, that the en en enabling environment we need is to look at a competing sector like the creatives and look at why the financial institutions have suddenly woken up and they're happy to lend and to finance that sector today. One is from the government perspective, the interests the minister has suddenly developed in the creative sector and providing things like funds, creative funds, from which players can tap into. And those funds can only be disbursed through commercial banks, in which case the FIs, the financial institutions, are compulsorily involved. Secondly, making the sector attractive to international investors such that the financial institutions themselves are also interested, knowing that the, their, of their potential investors who can be involved in bankable projects are involved in. So to do this, one, government funds, two, we want policy that would enable activities that would attract investors. In the creative sector today, you have what we call film festivals, which is a terrain where you have people who can whether internationally or locally, who have access to what our talent 
has to offer. We need those sorts of forums that would expose and give recognition to our own you know, talent. That way, on the international terrain, there's more investment um, interest. Also, in creating this investment environment, I had heard from the last um, presentation that we need to sell, which is outrightly, this is even beyond privatization, <laughs> outrightly sell the public infrastructure. Well, in our own little group, what we had proposed was a form of licensing. It could be long leases. So someone came up with a brilliant idea of having big, huge corporate brands. Just think of the typical huge FMCG who licenses a stadium. Imagine if you gave out all the stadium to each corporate brand for 10 years. Of course, they are using it for branding activity, but they are revamping it, upgrading it, and they are running it. So it still belongs to government at the end of the day, but there's a rolling lease arrangement. That way, the stadia is running. That, of course, doesn't take away from the fact that there's ample land, which infrastructure had spoken to, to build new stadia. And in relation to that, we had proposed that we check the existing laws to ensure that there are no bottlenecks in our legislation today that would hinder public participants obtaining permits for building stadia. And that if there is, we need policy that would free up those bottlenecks. Someone actually said the same way today, with it, in a twinkling of an eye, you can set up a church easily <laughs> that it will be good for people to be able to have access to permits that would allow stadia to be built. But we recognize the fact that this must be well regulated such that standards are maintained. So again, we still need government in terms of regulating you know, this area, you know, in terms of setting you know, standards um, in this area. So that's in relation to the government's infrastructure. We also identify the fact that It was thought about that perhaps today, if we look at all the infrastructure regulation we have today, that we may need a special one for sports. We don't know yet until we check. But if we need one for sports infrastructure to ensure these standards are international and to ensure that it's well regulated, then we need, we would get one. As a further incentive to investors, we talked about tax. Tax is the usual incentive that comes to mind first when we're talking about investor incentives. And we thought about the fact that, well, there may be existing legislation already that with various tax incentives for investors, whether in terms of merchandising or in terms of infrastructure development, that there may be incentives already. And it's important to bring this to the fore because if it's not brought to the fore, it would not be attractive. And where it does not exist, it can be created. We looked again at the creative sector, where in the wake of trying to incentivize international investors, Lai Mohammed proudly announced the fact that any productions that are being done on Nigerian soil using Nigeria infrastructure would have huge tax incentives. Essentially, what he was trying to say was, um, all of you flying to SA, and filming in SA, you're doing us a disservice, let's bring it home. Yes, we know that that couldn't have stood on its own without Nigeria having its own infrastructure, but at least it incentivized people who were willing to go and develop studios and the necessary infrastructure in Nigeria. So we're wondering if there can be special tax incentives for infrastructure development or other facility development you know, in Nigeria, or even for importation of equipment, you know, which is very key for, for sports. In that same vein, we talked about two other things. One is um, in relation to, we do know about the 17 SDG goals. And yes, it's all about, you know, basically eradicating poverty, bringing peace and prosperity, at the heart of that in relation to sports is the fact that our youth need to be developed. Our youth need to, the, the, and a way of developing the youth would also tie into what we call nation building. We're a very diverse economy, a nation today. So in ensuring this nation, nation building, 
we feel that government will be very interested, and government needs to participate in this, in the fact that sports actually is what can be used to unite. And in this case, if we go across the subnational levels, where there are various government sports agencies, in some places there are commissions, in some places is ministries, if all of them, in one way or the other, partner this time with the social enterprises, it may be a way of actually achieving, for, from the government side, the goal of nation building. For the, so from the social enterprises side, they're forever looking for ways to invest in social enterprises. Sports doesn't automatically come to mind because it's seen as a luxurious type sector. They will probably think of things like health, education, but it's important for social enterprises to see sports as a social enterprise or a means to a social enterprise. And from the point of view of nation building, they should be able to partner with government and sow their funds in this area. They wouldn't give the money to government, obviously, but through appropriate participation, they can actually help in developing across our states or other um, subnational you know, levels. In relation to, back to the issue of enabling environment for investors, it had been mentioned that um, our agreements need to have appropriate dispute resolution mechanisms. And we believe that beyond just having the clauses, it's important for us to have the necessary expertise and environment for us. Fortunately, we had people in our group who are from the Lagos Court of Arbitration. The typical clauses you would find in the agreements in terms of um, dispute resolution mechanisms are arbitration clauses. Today, what we do know as lawyers is the fact that there's no specialization for sports, for sports arbitration, the same way you have with other areas, other sectors. So that specialization needs to be developed. A special subsect of the LCA needs to develop sports arbitration. So we need a policy, some form of policy, you know, to that effect. So the framework first, and then the training for the specialization that is required. Stating, going back again to data, we have talked about dearth of data. It had been identified that the National Bureau of Statistics is the, should we say, the king room of our data collection. Obviously, they are either overwhelmed or under-participating, whichever way we look at it. We believe that we actually, it is not as complicated as we think, that if we, across the grassroots, data can actually be collected. And by grassroots, we mean the schools and the clubs in order for us to harness the required data. And what is this data required? For us to even know what talent we have or, what, or to unlock the potential that we have, whether in terms of talent, facilities, or anything related thereto, it's important to know all the, the number of youths that are in the age bracket we're talking about, the number of youths that are in active participation in sports, and the number of facilities that we have. So we believe that this data can be collected even through the NBS. But the easiest way is for the NBS to actually have someone specifically in charge of sports monitoring that would see to the collection of this data across the various levels of our federation. So data collection, it's, we're going to have a policy you know, to that effect and have the data monitoring agents for this purpose. We've already mentioned broadcasts, so data, just trying to think. I think this is a summary of what we focused on, but like I said earlier on, I don't think we are a separate group. I think so we are all, all of us have actually talked about policy recommendations in one way or the other, but the way to go is to look at existing policy first and see what we can do to either harness that policy or we make new recommendations. Sorry, someone has their hand up. Actually, Mrs. Obi came into our group and she made a fundamental point, which is the fact that really there's more happening at the state levels than as a federation. 
that even the stadium today, I mean, we know in Lagos, for example, Taslim belongs to Lagos State. So to the extent that we have also state commissions that it may, we may need across regions. So she actually made that point already, that we made it. The good thing about doing across regions is you have some states that are a lot more proactive than others, and others follow. So if you take a proactive state like Lagos State and get it right with them, you'll just find that other states are implementing a model law, as opposed to waiting for the almighty <laughs> federal law, federal government. You know. So this is a summary of ours. Thank you very much. You know, we, had, we thank all the groups. And you know, let me also uh, 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 talk about, Buki, your question is the answer to that question is simply that sports is not on the exclusive list. It is on the concurrent list. Therefore, it's the responsibility of states to, and local governments to implement. But what we have here is that policy, sports industry policy is always national. Each country has, if you go in and put policy of Japan, you will not find policy of the Osaka prefecture. You will find, uh, you know, Osaka might have its own, but what you have is Japan. Australia has, but you'd be surprised, Queensland would have. But Queensland derives its own from what the national body has. Ditto in England, ditto America. So we need a sports industry policy. Then we sit down with the National Council of Sports and engage them to implement. Thank, well, I'm very happy you know, with what we have received so far. I'm also very happy on behalf of our team that um, people are saying it will be developed further. Let me give you very small insight. We just received a mail from, um, is it Zeno, is it Tech Hub? Talent Hub. They are organizing a session tomorrow. They were here for education. They are organizing their own stakeholder to put their report together for us. And they only just copied us and asked if one or two people could show up there tomorrow. We expect similar things to happen with other groups. In fact, we're going to probably be very busy over the next one or two weeks attending a few of those things. So moving forward from today, we're going to send the report by Friday or Monday. Today is Monday. By Friday, we expect you will get the, today's report. You'll also get the memorandum uh, template where we expect that you will give us feedback from further engagement. And then we will send you a letter in the first week of um, March saying, are you going to be available on 18th and 19th of March to join us in Benin? If so, please indicate. And we hope to see you. But on behalf of the NESG and the Federal Ministry of Youth and Sport, we must appreciate the input that we have got today. Honestly, uh, when some people started driving me out of the room when I was coming and saying 10 minutes to go, I, asked, I said, uh, this is what we get every time. We'll also send you a message about by tomorrow about Thursday's session with the multilaterals and the multinationals. If you are free, we would gladly welcome you. I think that perspective will be very interesting as well. You know, we will be taking a one final group picture, and refreshments are served. Now, those who came from far and wide, we wish you journey messages, and we thank you again for helping us on this journey towards a reformed sports industry. Thank you and good afternoon. So, group picture. Group picture. Group picture, please.